College of Science and Engineering seminars here and same group. Uh, same group of people. Today's is a little different in that, uh, and, and I won't speak much about Friday's event, but we have a, a very well known <coughs> physicist visiting Armenia, visiting uh, AUA, visiting uh, our, our president, uh, coming to town uh, over the next few days. And given the topic area and given uh, our own, what's called collective uh, areas of expertise, given the gap, yeah, that's a, uh, it's a kind way to put it, maybe, uh, to myself and to, to everyone here, or maybe not everyone here, some of you I know have a physics background, uh, but given that, we thought uh, we'd happily accept our President Polosian's uh, offer to give us a kind of like pre-lecture lecture, or pre-seminar seminar. So today, the whole purpose of today, and if I understood correctly, uh, it'll be kind of a more informal, maybe a discussion, maybe uh, some you know questions and, and discussions throughout. Uh, President Pelosian will uh, clarify if I'm saying anything wrong. But the idea is to kind of bring all of us collectively up to speed on statistical physics and and, and some of the sort of very cutting edge and, and even from what I'm understanding now, controversial. Uh, <coughs> areas in, in science that this very big name, Constantino uh, Tellis, who is visiting us, is, is, uh, is a leading proponent of. Uh, so I think uh, it should be very interesting. And again, uh, I know you guys are very busy uh, with classes and all, and, and, and uh, two additional seminars. I'll just say that uh, we are also busy, I'm, and the president is maybe the busiest of them all. Uh, so I think it's great that we can all find time uh, for this, and, and I, I think on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you, uh, uh, President Bolosian, and I don't know, if, if that's a good enough introduction. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine, thank you very much. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to discuss this, as, as Adam just said, this, um, the, the speaker tomorrow really is, is very well known internationally, especially in, in, in the field of physics, and especially in, in this interface between thermodynamics and statistical physics and how this connects to complex systems, including... Do you remember the title of his talk? It's Complex Systems in, I think, Natural Systems, Social Systems, uh, Computer Systems, Artificial Systems as well. Uh, things that, that thermodynamics and statistical mechanics have traditionally never been applied to. And, and so it is controversial. You might think that in the sciences everything is very, very uh, uh, objective and people just look at results and, and there's not room for personalities and debates and things like that. In this area, there, there is. It, it, what what the tomorrow's speaker is, is doing this whole program of research is very controversial. And um, it, it, there's a lot of interest in it throughout the world. I'm going to say that there are on the order of thousands of papers published on this. And interestingly, this is one of those things that is catching on. Um, there's a lot of papers in Europe there's many, many, many papers from Latin America. This is something that has captured the imagination of Latin American scientists in particular. Um, and elsewhere uh, uh, as, as well, in, in Asia as well, he has this list of countries that the papers are coming out in, in this so-called Salas thermostatistics that that he has been championing. And it's from all over the world. It's an international effort. Um, and proportionately, I, I, there's, there's fewer papers on this coming out in the US, which I find interesting. And I don't really know how to explain it. But I'm curious, just because this does, it, the, number one, this is mathematical to some extent. Uh, it's unavoidable. Uh, it involves. Uh, the mathematics that it involves is really no more than uh, things that you would get in a calculus sequence. In particular, multivariable calculus is involved in this. Um, I assume you've all had background in calculus. You're all, uh, for the most part anyway, had engineering degrees coming in 
to this program. Uh, I'm going to assume it, but I'm not going to assume it so much that I don't remind you of a few things at the beginning of the talk. The second thing it involves is thermodynamics. And this, I don't necessarily assume that you have a background in. Uh, who here has studied thermodynamics before coming to AUM? Okay, so, all right, let me spend more time giving an introduction to that. Um, the third thing it involves is statistical physics, and in that area, I'm going to assume that, that you don't know anything about it, uh, whether you do or not. Now. How many of you have seen statistical physics coming in? So, okay, my assumption is correct. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a bit about how Salas's generalization of this. So, so that's the outline. I'll talk a little bit about multivariable calculus and, and just remind you the two or three things you need to remember for this. And then thermodynamics, then the usual Boltzmann Gibbs thermostatistics, which has been for the past 150 years how everybody has done everything. And then Salas's generalization of it and why it's so controversial. Okay, let's start with the following thing that I hope, as soon as I say this, maybe you'll remember this from multivariable calculus. <laughs> Suppose I have a quantity z, and it depends on two things, x and y. And I ask, how can z change? If I change x, there's only two ways z can change. I could change x or I could change y. And so, the change in z, the little differential change in z, is the rate of change of z with respect to x times the change in x, plus the rate of change of z with respect to y times the change in y. Right? There's only two things z depends on, x and y. If it, the change in z could be due to the change in either of those two things, and so the total change in z is just the sum of those two things. Right? You all remember what the partial derivatives are. That kind of makes sense to you? If I've got a variable like pressure that depends on volume and temperature, and I change the volume a bit, and I change the temperature a bit, part of the change in pressure is going to be due to the change in volume. Part of it's going to be due to the change in temperature. Is this OK? Yeah? And what that means is if I have one differential, that's expressed as a sum of quantities times two other differentials, I can interpret the coefficients there as the rates of change. So if I see dz as a times dx plus b times dy, I know that a is the rate of change of z with respect to x, and I know that b is the rate of change of z with respect to y. This, in a, in a calculus course, is called the multivariable chain. Okay? That also means, uh, now sometimes books will go a little bit further. And they'll say, well, this is the rate of change of z with respect to x at constant y. That's what that subscript means. And this is the rate of change of z with respect to y keeping x constant at constant x. OK, but that's kind of understood. When you take a partial derivative, you treat the other variables as constants, right? OK, so far so good? Okay. Now, the next thing that you should try to remember is how to compute a maximum or a minimum. This is like an optimization theory. Suppose I have some function, z of x and y, and it's equal to, and the example I'm giving is x squared plus y squared, right? And somebody asks you, find the minimum of that function. What's the smallest value that that function can take on? What is it? Zero. zero. Where is it? Zero, zero. zero, zero. Good. OK, so how would you find that? Well, I could take the derivative of z with respect to x, and it's at 2x. The derivative of z with respect to y, and that gives me 2y. And what I do is set both of those derivatives equal to 0. And that gives me the location, x equals y equals 0. And then I can plug those in there to find out that the minimum is 0. Okay, Because at, at the minimum, the thing isn't changing very much. I can change a little bit in x and a little bit in y, but at the minimum, it's not 
it's not changing z very much, and that's why I can set both of those equal to zero and find the minimum. Okay, so far so good. One, and here's the example I just gave you. One last thing. This is the last thing I'll remind you about from multivariable calculus. Suppose that I have a function and I want to minimize it or find its extremum, maximum, or minimum, and I have a constraint. Okay, so once again, I'm going to take the function z of x, y is equal to x squared plus y squared, and I want to find the minimum of that, but I want to find the minimum subject to a certain constraint. And the constraint is going to be, it's got to lie on the line x plus y is equal to 2. Okay, so I can't accept the answer 0, 0. That doesn't work anymore because it doesn't satisfy the constraint. Okay, so how do I do that? Okay, so let me just show you geometrically what this looks like. That's x and that's y. The contours of constant z are circles, right? With a minimum at, at, at the origin. But the constraint says that the solution has to lie on this straight line. Where is that line? x plus y equals 2 is a line that goes like this. It intersects the x-axis at 2, 0. It intersects the y-axis at 0, 2. And it's a straight line, so it goes right through both of them. So now you know where the minimum is going to be from this geometric picture. You know it's going to be right about there somewhere. It's not going to be at the origin anymore. How do I find it? Okay, so there's, there's a couple ways you could do this. One way is you could solve this for y, right? So y is equal to 2 minus x. And then plug that in there, and you'll get a function of x only, and minimize that. That's one way to do it, and it's, it's a perfectly good way to do it. The trouble is that sometimes the constraints are difficult to solve for one variable or the other. Right? You can't easily solve for them. Is there a better way to do it? And, and there is, and I'm not going to tell you why it works, but I'll tell you what it is. The, the other way to do it is to say that that's your objective function. That's the function you're trying to minimize. Define this to be, oh, what did I call it, w? Define this thing here to be the constraint function. Okay, so that's the constraint function. And this is the objective function. And the trick is the following. I'm going to define a new function, u, to be the objective function plus a constant times the constraint function. Okay. And now the trick is, so in this case, what is that? In this case, that's x squared plus y squared plus lambda times x plus y. The trick is this. Minimize this function. Right? So take the partial derivatives of this thing and set them equal to 0. So if I do that, du dx is 2x plus lambda. du dy is equal to 2y plus lambda. And I'm going to set those equal to 0. Now I've got a problem. I've got two equations in three unknowns. OK, what's the third equation that I need? The third equation is the constraint. Right, so now x plus y is equal to 2. Now I have three equations in three unknowns. Solve them. It's easy to solve that. And what you'll find is that x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1, and lambda is minus 2. That's the location of the minimum. Okay, so all you have to do is take the objective function, add a constant, and this constant is called a Lagrange multiplier. Add them together. Minimize that, and then throw in the constraint equation, and you're done. Okay? And that tells you how to find an extremum if there's a constraint present. Those are the only things that I'm asking you to remember for multivariable calculus. If you remember those things, everything else is just complicated. Yep? One question.
function actually if uh, I have something better there, not x squared, so I get not linear equations after that. Mm -hmm. Can I repeat this method to reduce the number on the x to, uh, to have linear equation later? So can I use the same method for the... Uh, no, it won't necessarily be linear. It, it, yes, but if it's yeah. not linear, can I start from the beginning, create another new function and uh, differentiate it again and continue? That Th this works with, I'm not sure I'm understanding, but this works with... If I have x uh, in the third, I do this once and yeah. I get x squared, right, in the uh, system. Oh, all right, yeah. And can I later continue with the same method again? Yeah. To solve that system with x squared, to reduce it uh, once more. Yeah, you, you might get nonlinear equations to solve, but it works, yeah. It always works. It doesn't matter, you know, we use the quadratic function here because when you differentiate it, you get something linear, and that makes life easier. And I use the linear constraint just because that makes life easier, and that gave three linear equations. But I didn't have to do that. If this had been, you know, cubic or quartic, and likewise, the constraint could have been nonlinear as well. It could have been quadratic, cubic. No problem. It could even be transcendental. Look at that. Exponential logarithms, tree functions running around in there. It always works. This this general method always works. It's independent of the fact that, that it's. So we need just any differentiable function, right? Any differentiable function. It's just got to be differentiable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, but, you know, your point is, is well taken because you could end up with nasty algebraic equations to solve them. But let's assume you could solve them and it still works. Other questions? This is totally informal, so interrupt me anytime you want to. And if you have questions, absolutely interrupt me. How many of you vaguely remember seeing this during a multivariable calculus course? Does, is this all? No? Some do, some don't, some heads are nodding vertically, others are nodding horizontally. Um, <coughs> does it make sense, kind of? I mean, you, you kind of see it. Okay. All right, good. So on to the next thing is thermodynamics. So now we have a 15-minute introduction of thermodynamics. Okay. Let me just... Uh, so thermodynamics was invented in the 1800s, and the reason was that people started building steam engines in the 1800s, and they wanted to understand how they work. So thermodynamics arose from engineering. Its beginnings were in engineering, not in physics, not in chemistry, not in any of the other fields that were used now. Um, it was, it was invented for very, very practical reasons. And, um, and you can see that in the examples that people typically give in thermodynamics. Uh, today we realize thermodynamics is much more general than steam engines. It's much more general than gases and liquids and cylinders and pistons. It can be applied to many, many things. You can apply thermodynamics to magnets. You can apply thermodynamics to all kinds of physical systems. But there's a few things that all of them have in common. You have some kind of system, and usually it's a material system, and it can be in a whole bunch of different states. And what you're trying to understand is what state it wants to live in, what state it stably lives in, and what the relationships are between the properties of that state. All thermodynamic systems have the ability to absorb some amount of heat. Right? You can heat them up. If I put a fire on them, they'll get hotter. I can add heat to them. All thermodynamic systems have the opportunity to do work on their surroundings. If I have a steam engine, when the steam engine pushes the piston to turn the wheel, it's doing work. Work in the sense of physics, force times distance, work on the system. Okay, and um, there's a few other properties that any thermodynamic system has. There's always some total internal energy in the system. It's usually all the energy contained in, 
you know, the heat energy and, or magnetic energy or potential energy, any other, any energy that's contained in the system. We call the internal energy U. The other property that any thermodynamic system has is temperature. It, it lives at some temperature T. And you can measure temperature in any units you want. You can measure temperature in degrees Celsius. You can measure temperature, but that's not very convenient because it doesn't go to zero at absolute zero. It's much better to measure temperature in degrees Kelvin. And it's even better, better just to measure temperature in ergs or joules uh, as, a, as a unit of energy. Temperature is energy. And so you might as well use that unit, and that's the unit I'm going to use throughout. Then there's optional properties that thermodynamic systems can have. They can have, a, if it's a gas in a container, it can be under a certain amount of pressure, P. The container can have a certain volume, V. If it's a magnet, it has a certain magnetic strength or magnetization, M. All of these are optional properties of the system. Okay, so here's the first point. The total, there's two things that can happen to a, a thermodynamic system. I said I can add heat to it, and it can do work. Now, if you add heat to it, you're adding energy to it. If it does work, it's losing energy. Right? This is conservation of energy. So the first law of thermodynamics is the change in the energy of the system, the change in the internal energy of the system, is the amount of heat that you add to it minus the amount of work that it does. If you add a bunch of heat to it, and then it turns a wheel, well, the amount of heat you add is, is energy going in. The energy that it expends to turn the wheel is energy going out. Right? So you've got to subtract those two things. That's all there is to the first law of thermodynamics. Um, but now there's a question. What are the independent variables in this thing, right? I had before you, ha you saw on the board, dz is, right, I, I wrote this on the board. In this case, the independent variables are x and y. Those are the variables you can, you can change. The dependent variable is z. That's the thing that changes when you muck around with the independent variables, right? So in this case, what are the independent variables? We don't really know yet. You might say, well, they're dq and dw. Maybe, the, maybe, those are the, maybe heat and work are your independent variables. Unfortunately, they're not. And people in the early 1800s realized this. What they realized is, suppose, and this is the classic example of a thermodynamic system. Suppose that I have a cylinder, and it's filled with gas or, or liquid or vapor or something like that. And I have a piston that I can push up and down. And I can compress the gas, or I can let the gas expand. And now, and I might be able to, to uh, hold this thing at a temperature T, right? I can put this thing under water, and I can keep the water at a temperature T. And now I have two ways to cycle the system. I can push down on the gas, or I can let up on the cylinder and expand it. Another way to cycle the system is I can change the temperature T. I can lower the temperature T, or I can raise the temperature T. And so in one case, I'm changing the volume, V. In the other case, I'm changing the temperature, T. And now suppose I go around a loop. Suppose I compress the gas, lower the temperature, and then expand the gas, and then raise the temperature to come right back where I started from. When I'm done, the temperature is the same, the volume is the same. OK, so I've taken the system through a cycle. Air, condition, air conditioners and refrigerators do this kind of thing. You compress the gas, you change the temperature, you expand the gas, you change the temperature back, and you've gone through now a thermodynamic cycle. And you know what? If you do that, the amount of heat in the system when you come right back to the beginning won't be the same as when you started. And the work that the system has done 
on the environment won't come back to zero. Q and W are not functions of the state of the system. Right? So dQ and dW here are not really the differentials of anything. There's no function Q that depends only on the state of the system. I can take the system through a cycle and come right back to where I started and Q will be different. It's not a function. There's no function Q that that's the differential of. Likewise with work. There's no function W that if I go around the cycle, I come right back to where I started from. And that's a problem. For this reason, there's many textbooks that don't like writing it that way. And they'll put a little slash through the D or some other notation like that to emphasize the fact Q is not a function. W is not a function. They don't exist. DQ is just the amount of heat that you add, but it's not a function of the state of the system. That's a problem. And the first 50 years of thermodynamics, from 1800 to 1815, people, I would argue, people spent that whole time trying to figure out what the right independent variables were for this equation. Questions about that? Does that kind of make sense? If you don't stop, you don't get charge it. So let's take one of them. We've got the Q and DW. They're both problems. Neither of them are functions of the state of the system. Let's figure out how to deal with DW. Okay. I'm going to draw a picture here. Let's go back to the cylinder. Now I'm going to do a, use my artistic abilities here and try to do a 3D picture of the cylinder. Can you kind of see what that is, right? So yes. now you're pushing it up and down there. And let's suppose that the area of the piston is A. Let's suppose that the pressure of the gas inside is P. Okay? And let's suppose that I move the piston a, di a distance. Let me call this distance. It's, it's small, so let me call it B. Okay? And suppose that the gas expand, we're, we're, we're talking about the gas doing work on its environment. So the gas is going to expand, it's going to push the piston up a little bit. Right? Work is force times distance. Right? Oh, thank you. For <laughs> okay. This is energy saving. I see. You're not moving enough, I guess, so. So that's a little bit too dark. Top <laughs> Yes, a little bit. Okay. Can you, you can still see this. Yeah. Okay. What's the force on that piston? Force is pressure times what? Area. Right? So the force that's being exerted on the piston is pressure times area. Now what's work? Right? This change in work. How do you express work in terms of force and distance? F times D. F times D X. Good. So that's P A D X, right? And what's A times D X? That's the change in volume, right? Area times D X is the change in volume. So the work that's done is pressure times D volume. That's the thermodynamic work that's being done on the piston. Yeah? So now we can write the first law like this. Yeah? And what, what's the advantage of doing that? Remember, dW doesn't depend on the state of the system. It's not a function. It's not a real high function. V certainly is a function. Right? When I go through a cycle, the volume has to return back to where it was. Obviously, if I'm, I'm going back to my initial position, the volume will be the same. Volume, we know, is a real lot of thermodynamic quantity. It depends on the state of the system. If I cycle the thing, the volume comes right back to where I start. No problems there. And we've solved the problem now in the second term. We still haven't solved it in the first term. Okay, so... 
And, and by the way, internal energy is also clearly a thermodynamic state. Energy is, is something real, it's something you can measure. Volume you can measure. It depends only on the thermodynamic state. Two things have different energy, they're in different thermodynamic states. Two things have different volume, they're in different thermodynamic states. But heat is one of those things where I can cycle the thermodynamic state, come back to the same volume and temperature, and the heat content to a change. It's still a so how do I deal with that? And now this one, well, for the first 50 years of thermodynamics, from 1800 to 1850, people didn't know how to deal with that. What they did was they used this equation, which we just figured out how to derive. They knew that. They knew that steam engines had to obey this equation. And then they also used some equation of state for the system, for the gas in the system. Now, in, in high school, many of you will have learned the ideal gas equation of state, right? Pressure times volume is proportional to temperature, <coughs> right? You've seen this, I'm hoping, uh, at some point. There's a relationship between pressure and volume and temperature for any gas. If you, if you squeeze the thing by lowering its volume, its pressure is going to increase if you do that constant temperature. And you can write an algebraic relationship between pressure and volume and temperature. And for an ideal gas, that's, that's it. Okay, so now, between 1800 and 1850, when they were making steam engines, they had this equation, and they had this equation. And they could put them together and they could predict things. They could predict, well, if the steam in the cylinder expands and if the total energy is constant, then the amount of heat that you add is proportional to nt over d times the change in volume. And they could figure things out from that. And that was how they were doing thermodynamics until about 1850. And they still didn't know what the other independent variable was. And then finally, in 1850, Rudolf Clausius figured it out. And what he figured out, and I'm not going to tell you the detailed reason for this. If, if you want to know it, you can take a course in thermodynamics. But uh, I will tell you what the result is. And the, the result is easy to understand, even if you don't understand everything that goes into it. What he noticed, what Clausius noticed, is that even though dq you know, when you measure all the little changes, dq, going around the cycle, coming back to where you started, even though those don't add up to zero, so that you have net heat gain or loss in the system, even though the little dqs don't add up to zero, if you weight it by one over the temperature, it will add up to zero. So if I take dq over the temperature as I go through the cycle, and I add all those things up, I will come back to where I started. And that paper was published in 1850 by Clausius. And what Clausius concluded from that is that even though dq is not the differential of something, dq over t is the differential of something. And he called that quantity s, and he gave it the name the entropy. And entropy s is a real function of the thermodynamic state of the system. If I go through a cycle, the entropy will come right back to where it started. Okay, and that was a key observation in thermodynamics. Okay. Questions? Yeah. I have a strange question. Was this experimentally discovered by him? Or was this, um, was this actually mathematical? Was more mathematical. It was... So if you take a course in thermodynamics, one of the things that you'll be forced to study early in the course is the idea of a Carnot cycle. And that's where this idea came from. Right, but even that could have been experimentally I think it, conducted, it, it, right? It, it, it certainly was motivated by experiments. Right, because right. steam engines, if you think about them, are constantly going through cycles. Right? Right. This, all a steam engine does is cycle all day long. And so they had to understand the behavior of thermodynamic systems that's like that. And so I think it was motivated by experiment, and then people like Carnot and people like Clausius scratched their head and thought about it a lot, and then they came up with that key observation. So I'm eliminating a lot here, but, but, uh, but that's the point. Even though DQ isn't a differential, 
The S is, and S is called the entropy. And that means that now, if, if dS is dQ over T, that means dQ is T dS, okay? So just like we put dW as minus P dV, we can now put dQ as T dS. And the first law becomes this. Okay? Questions? And now you see what the independent variables are, right? The independent variables are entropy and volume. Energy, internal energy, depends on entropy and volume. And now, if you keep that multivariable calculus theorem in the back of your mind, right, you can easily read off that the rate of change of energy with respect to entropy is temperature, and the rate of change of energy with respect to volume is minus the pressure. Okay? And now everything is a thermodynamic variable. This was the state of thermodynamics in 1850. And it's been, aside from details, it's been, and, and embellishments, it's pretty much unchanged since. Now Clausius has figured out that the right independent variables to measure energy in terms of were entropy and volume. And you could even figure out what the partial derivatives are of energy with respect to those quantities. And those partial derivatives are very useful. One is temperature, the other is pressure. They're two of the most fundamental things you can measure. Okay. Questions about that? Now, let's suppose that, so entropy and temperature, uh, sorry, entropy and volume are now considered the natural independent variables in which you can measure energy. If you know the energy in terms of entropy and volume, you can take partial derivatives to get temperature and pressure. Of course, if you know u as a function of s and v, when I take those partial derivatives, I'm going to get temperature as a function of s and v. And I'm going to get pressure as a function of s and v. Right? But now what I can do is, once I have temperature as a function of s and v, and once I have pressure as a function of S and B, I can eliminate S between those. And when I do, what am I going to get? If I eliminate S between those two things, I'm going to get pressure as a function of T and B. And what's that? The equation of state. Right? So in other words, from this approach, I can derive the equation of state. I don't have to give it separately as a separate bit of information. If I know the energy is a function of its natural variables, S and V, that's as good as knowing the equation of state and more. Okay, that's everything you can possibly know about the system thermodynamically, if I know energy is a function of S and V. I can actually derive the equation of state from that. I can now start thinking about changes in energy, changes in temperature, changes in volume. All of that I can figure out. I can figure out exactly what my steam engine is going to do. I can figure out what the efficiency of it is going to be. All of that I have. I just need to know U in terms of S and V. There's another, and, and by the way, the notion that there is a function entropy that is a state of, the, of the, the, a function of the thermodynamic state of the system is the beginning of what's called the second law of thermodynamics. It's just the first half of the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so now you've seen what that is. There's one other bit to the second law of thermodynamics, and that is, and Clausius also noticed this, if a system is changing in some slow, reversible way, without any friction, without any loss, um, the entropy will be unchanged. But if you change the system rapidly in a reversible way that gives rise to friction, the entropy will change. But what Clausius also noticed is it can only increase. Entropy can never decrease. And that's the second part of the second law of thermodynamics. So in other words, that quantity ds is always greater than or equal to zero. And, and 
That means entropy only increases. It can only go up. Its differential is only positive. And that means that equilibria happen when entropy is maximized. So now we've had one big problem. We didn't know what the independent variables are. It took people 50 years to solve that problem. Now we have the first and second laws of thermodynamics. We understand now that internal energy, its natural variables are entropy and volume. Are there any remaining problems? Yeah, there's a big one. How do you measure entropy? I know how to measure temperature. I get a thermometer. I know how to measure pressure. I get a pressure gauge and I stick it in the tire. I know how to measure volume. I can take a ruler and measure the size of the container and figure out what the volume is. How do I measure entropy? It's not easy to measure. As it turns out, you can, but it's not easy to do. You really don't want to have entropy being one of your independent variables, and it's kind of unfortunate that it turned out to be one of your independent variables. It would be nice if we could get rid of it and make a new independent variable. Okay, is there a way to do that? Yeah, there is. There's a neat way to do that, and the way to do it is to define a new energy, a new kind of energy. Instead of calling it U, we're going to call it A. It's called the Helmholtz free energy. And it's equal to U minus the temperature times the entropy. And my claim is that that's a function of temperature and volume. Two easy things to measure. It's no longer a function. Now, you might say, how do you know that's not a function of entropy? I see entropy on the right-hand side of this equation. Okay, how do you know that A, the way that I've constructed it there, is not a function of entropy? I'll show you how. I can differentiate A with respect to S. If I do that, I get du ds minus T. Right? If I differentiate this with respect to S, I get T. So I get du ds minus T, but remember that du ds is T. So that's t minus t, or 0. In other words, the derivative of a with respect to entropy is 0. That means it doesn't depend on entropy. So I've constructed a new quantity that doesn't depend on entropy. This is good, because I don't know how to measure entropy. So a is a different kind of energy than the one we started with. It's not the total internal energy. It's internal energy minus Ts. And it's called the free energy, or, or the Helmholtz free energy. Now, what is this maneuver of subtracting Ts from a variable to create a new variable that has a new dependent variable that has different independent variables? It's called a Legendre transform. And here's one way to understand why it works. If I write u minus Ts, let me factor out T. In fact, I'm going to factor out a minus T. And so then I get S minus 1 over temperature times u. From here on in, whenever you see beta, it means 1 over the temperature. Turns out the inverse of the temperature is more useful than the temperature itself. So we, we give it a special name. We call it beta. OK, so I'm writing A is negative t, s minus beta u. Now remember, s in equilibrium, we maximize. It's, it's, you get an equilibrium when s is big. Okay, now what we're doing is taking S minus a constant times U. Does that remind you of anything? Does that remind you of anything I showed you from multivariable calculus? Beta looks an awful lot like a Lagrange multiplier. By maximizing S at constant internal energy, I would introduce the Lagrange multiplier beta and maximize this quantity instead. The only thing is, if I stick a negative sign in front of it, I've got to minimize that quantity. So minimizing the free energy is the same thing as maximizing the entropy at constant energy. That's a really, really good thing to do. Because energy is conserved in systems. If energy is conserved, then you want to keep that constant when you maximize entropy. 
you don't want to maximize entropy and let the energy fly all over the place. The energy can't fly all over the place. It's conserved. You want to minimize, or rather maximize entropy at constant energy. And you would do that with a Lagrange multiplier. And what you're seeing is that the free energy does exactly that. If I minimize the free energy, I've got my maximum entropy state at a constant energy. And that's why this is so useful. So that is basically my 20-minute introduction to thermodynamics. And the result of it is that you really want to minimize the free energy of the system. The free energy of the system is the energy of the system minus temperature times entropy. Entropy emerges as a natural variable. And by the way, there's one other way that you can see that V and T are the natural variables, uh, independent variables to understand the free energy. I'm defining A to be U minus TS, right? So what's the differential of A? Well, it's the differential of U minus and now I do the derivative of the product thing, right? It's the first times the differential of the second plus the second times the differential of the first. So I get this. But remember that du is TDS minus PDV. And now the TDS is canceled. That's why entropy goes away as an independent variable. And I just end up with minus PDV minus SDT. What does that mean? Well, once again, you use that theorem over there for multivariable calculus, and you can see the derivative of A with respect to temperature is the negative of the entropy, and you can see the derivative of A with respect to volume is the negative of the pressure. Once again, so this means the natural variables for the free energy, A, are temperature and volume. If I knew A in terms of temperature and volume, if I knew what that function was, from this, I can compute the entropy as a function of temperature and volume. From this, I can produce the pressure as a function of temperature and volume. That second thing right there is the equation of state. Pressure is a function of temperature and volume. Once again, if I knew A as a function of T and B, I can get the equation of state, and I can get much more. Okay? That's it for thermodynamics. Questions at this point? Because now I want to go to the microscopic theory. This was everything that people understood about thermodynamic systems up until about 1860 we have captured here. Questions? I know that's a lot to digest in a few minutes, but you got the gist of it. I'm hoping that I'm putting the equations up there, but I'm talking a lot too, and I'm hoping that the talking, what you don't see in the equations, I'm hoping you, you hear from my words. Does it make sense? Practically speaking, what is a minimization of free energy? Like in a real system, how would you characterize that? How would you describe it? Um, suppose that I have a, a system, and I have some way to capture its energy just as a function of temperature and volume. Um, The notion is that if I can, now, now you, you don't always have that, right? In a real system, if I change the uh, temperature, I'm going to kind of change the energy. Uh, likewise, the volume. Um, and I'm going to produce heat as I do that. If I have some way of, of it's very difficult to intuit physically what free energy is, but if I have some way of measuring energy as a function of temperature and volume, the notion is that's the thing you should minimize in order to figure out what an equilibrium is. Um, here's one way to understand it. And this is for irreversible processes, right? It's, it's an irreversible process, something with friction that will take you to that minimum of free energy. Why is it that energy minima describe equilibrium? Suppose I have a little valley here, and I put a ball in there, and there's friction. What's going to happen? The ball is going to roll down to the bottom of the valley, right? In other words, the ball is seeking the minimum of potential energy. Energy minima tend to be equilibrium, dynamical equilibrium. But in the case of a thermodynamic, in the case of this mechanical system, it's easy to see. 
In the case of the thermodynamic system, it's really difficult to get an intuition for it. But the free energy is to the thermodynamic system what the potential energy is to the ball in the valley. The thermodynamic system tends to roll down to a minimum of free energy the same way the ball rolls down to a minimum of potential energy. That's one possible intuition. If you could, if I may, describe the Let's say we have the equilibrium temperature here. There is uh, uh, all different uh, energy flows are canceling them out, so there is nothing that goes. And we all of a sudden bring uh, a cup of tea, hot cup of tea here. Yep. And uh, naturally, hot cup of tea will give its energy to the surroundings. And the total energy will increase, but the energy of the cup will uh, de decrease. Uh, it's, it's one situation. We will bring it will bring a uh, uh, cold cup into in, into the room. Its its temperature uh, will uh, it, it will take energy from the surroundings, and the total energy of the system will go so that there is no more any exchange. Yes, that's the key. If there is no more exchange, that's the Equilibrium. There's the, uh, the, the coffee cup being at the same temperature as the room is like the ball in the bottom of the bottom. It's, it's where it's happiest. And, and the thermodynamic system will eventually approach that point. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so what happened in 1860 to screw all of this up? Um, the atomic theory came along. And people stopped believing that gases and liquids were all smooth and continuous down to microscopic levels. They began to understand that there were atoms. The idea of molecules didn't quite come along yet originally. In the beginning, people knew there are particles down there somewhere. And if you keep chopping things down fine enough, you're going to get to the point where there's individual particles moving around, banging into one another. And uh, they're just too small for us to see, but we know they're there. And they began to understand this around the end of the 19th century. And how might you understand thermodynamics in this picture? Well, the internal energy is then the sum of all the kinetic and potential energies of these molecules or atoms banging around with one another. You add up all the kinetic energy, you add up all the potential energy, and that's got to be your internal energy. There's nothing else down there. That's all the energy there is. So the internal energy, these atomists wanted to say, is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energies of the atoms in the system. What's the temperature? Well, by this way of thinking, the temperature is the average kinetic energy of an atom. What's the pressure? Well, if I have a wall of the container, the atoms are banging into it, and so they are exerting a certain amount of force per unit area, on average, on the wall. The atoms are constantly hitting the wall. Right? Is it in, in a time average sense, they're exerting a certain um, force per unit area on the walls. That's the pressure. So pressure is atoms banging into walls. Temperature is average kinetic energy of an atom. Total internal energy is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energies of everything. And somehow, this microscopic theory had to be reconciled with the macroscopic theory. Now, there are some fields in which this reconciliation has been achieved. There are other fields in which this reconciliation has not been achieved. I would argue that economics is a field where we have microeconomics, we have macroeconomics, and we still don't know, after 50 or 100 years, how one is derived from the other. In physics, we were fortunate. They figured it out. Back in the 1860s, 1870s, it was realized how you could derive thermodynamic properties just from the idea of molecules hitting one another and exerting a force on one another. And that's what I'll show you next. Okay. And this was done by Boltzmann, uh, working in uh, Germany. It was uh, Gibbs, working in the United States, and Maxwell, working in Scotland, 1860s, 1870s. So now we have to 
get a new framework. We have to, instead of thermodynamic states, we're going to call thermodynamics as our macroscopic theory. And it has macroscopic states. If we go down to atoms, we have many, many, many more states. Right? The atoms individually have velocities, they have positions, and in order to reproduce the microscopic state of the system, you would have to put every atom in exactly the same place to get exactly the same microscopic state. There are zillions, infinities of microscopic states of the system. Many, many more than there are thermodynamic states. There, and, and what that means is that many times different microscopic states correspond to the same macroscopic state. Right? If I have two states that differ just because at one moment, one atom is in the same place, but headed in a different direction. That's going to correspond to the same macroscopic state. There's many, many microscopic states corresponding to the same macroscopic state. In much more fine grain. Thermodynamic states are coarse grain. Microscopic states are fine grain. Now, let's pretend for a moment that these states are discrete. Let's pretend that we could count them. There's Microscopic state number one, microscopic state number two, microscopic state number three. Let's pretend that we could count them. In reality, in classical mechanics, you can't. There's a continuum of, of states at the microscopic level. Ironically, in quantum mechanics, you, you can count them, right? You get discrete energy states, quantum mechanically, that states can be in. Quantum statistical mechanics is arguably easier than classical statistical mechanics for this reason. You can sum over discrete states in quantum mechanics. You have to integrate over them in classical mechanics. It makes life easier to use discrete states. So let's use discrete states. You don't need to know any quantum mechanics. Just assume that the states are countable. You can have a one state, another state, another state. And what properties do these states have? Um, every microscopic state has a certain energy associated with it. If the state is J, we use epsilon J to denote the energy of that state. Okay, that's the only property really that we're going to attribute to the microscopic states. Now that epsilon J may depend on the volume of the container, it may depend on a lot of other things, but that's all we're going to assume. Here is one way of understanding what Gibbs and Boltzmann came up with. They said that the pro probability of a microscopic state is just proportional to e to the negative 1 over temperature. Remember, beta is 1 over temperature. e to the negative beta times the energy of that state. 1 over z is just a proportionality constant. Okay, so the probability of state J is just the exponential of minus the energy over T. Now, for the moment, let's regard that as a postulate. Let's regard that as, as, as uh, like an axiom. We're, we're going to take that to be true, and let's see what happens as a result of that. And then I'll show you how that doesn't need to be the, fun, the most fundamental postulate of how that could be derived. Okay, first of all, let's figure out what the proportionality constant is. Okay, 1 over z, this proportionality constant. Well, there's one thing that we know about probabilities, and that is they all have to sum to 1. Right? If the system has probability pj of being in state j, if I sum over all of those states, it's got to be in one of those states, right? So if I sum over those, I'd better get 1. Right? And that means I can pull, over the one over, pull out the 1 over z. And that means that z is equal to this. z is just the sum over all states of e to the minus 1 over temperature times the energy of the state. And that quantity turns out to be very important, and we call it the partition function of the system. You'll see why it's important. Right now, it just looks like a normalization constant. You'll see why it's so important in a moment. Um, notice that it's a function of temperature, because beta is 1 over temperature. It's a function of volume because these energies may depend on the volume of the system. Okay, but, but we'll, just, we'll just call it Z for now. And right now, it just looks like a proportionality constant to you. Okay, so, so again,
again, this is a postulate. Boltzmann and, and Gibbs and Maxwell tell us it's true, so we're assuming it's true. And now we know the probability of the microscopic system being in any particular study. If that's the case, how do you compute a macroscopic quantity? Well, suppose you want the energy. All you do is take the probability that the system is in state K and multiply it by the energy at state K and sum over all K. You're taking an expectation value, a probabilistic weighting of all of the states. Right? If the system has probability P0 of being in state 0 and the energy of state 0 is E0, then I multiply those together. I just take a probabilistic weighting of all those energies and that will give me the macroscopic internal energy of the system. Okay? And, and we denote that by the expectation value uh, we, we, we use angle brackets for that. Okay, so if I know the probability, if I know the energies of the microscopic states, this gives me a way of figuring out what the what U is. That's the thermodynamic U. That's the internal energy of the system. Right? You're just taking a probabilistic weighting, the probability of each state down to the energy of that state. Now, already we can see an interesting thing that we can do here. If that's true then here's another way you can understand that. You can note, take a look at that sum there. Notice that if I take this quantity here, which is the partition function z, right, and I take the derivative of it with respect to beta, that derivative with respect to beta is going to bring down a minus ek. It's going to give me exactly this, except with a minus sign. Can you see that? And if I take the derivative of e to the minus beta ek with respect to beta, I pull down a minus ek. So this sum here with the ek is just the derivative of this thing when you recognize the following. We just arrived that the internal energy is the negative beta derivative of the logarithm of the partition function. And we did that from microscopic considerations. We assumed Boltzmann gives restriction for the probabilities to get that, but that's a neat result. But now from thermodynamics, remember, the internal energy is the Helmholtz free energy plus Ts. Remember, Helmholtz free energy was energy minus Ts. So I just put the Ts on that side. And now I'm going to play the following game. Remember that S is the negative derivative of A with respect to temperature. Right? We derived that a few slides ago. You may not remember it, but S was, if I take the derivative of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to temperature, I get the negative entropy. So I just use that. And temperature times derivative with respect to temperature is the negative of beta times the derivative with respect to beta. That's because beta is one of three. So I can write it like that. And that's the derivative of a product, right? It's the derivative. Remember, if I take the derivative of a product, it's the derivative of the first times the second, plus the second times the derivative of the first, right? And now look what I've done. From thermodynamics, I've shown that free uh, sorry, internal energy is the beta derivative of this. And from the microscopic considerations I've shown that u is the beta derivative of negative log z. And that gives us the association that beta a is just the negative of log z. Or in other words, a is minus t times the log of z. And that is one of the most important equations in statistical physics. And then these folks realized this around 1870s or thereabouts. What that means and this is kind of amazing, is that if I know all the microscopic states of the system, I can form this function, z. Right? And I'm doing this from purely microscopic considerations. And now, I take its logarithm, I multiply it by the negative of the temperature, and what do I get? I get the Helmholtz free energy as a function of temperature and volume. And from that, I've already told you, you can compute anything you want. You can get the equation of state of the system. You can get any thermodynamic property of the system.
questions about that. That is the big connection between microscopic and macroscopic. That's the, the thing that you can, you can start playing wings that go on on the atomic scale, and from it you can derive something like an equation of state. And 100 years of statistical physics has been spent playing with this idea. And it's had great successes over the course of the last 150 years. Now, how am I doing on time? It's 3.30. Can I continue a bit more? Yeah? Just let me give you one example. And if you don't understand this example, don't worry. I'm really out to give you just the gist of this theory, the general ideas of the theory, so that you understand the, the intellectual tradition of how thermodynamics gave rise through atomic theory to statistical physics, and statistical physics can describe everything that thermodynamics can do, and, and even more. Uh, all of that is important to understand. And... Um, let me give you one example. And the example is very simple. It's the ideal gas. Suppose I have a bunch of atoms in a container. And there's no potential energy between them. All of the energy is kinetic. OK, 1 half mv squared is the kinetic energy of a particle, right? People remember that in physics. So I've got a box. I've got n particles in the box, n atoms in the box, and the, box, uh, the particles have mass m, little atoms bouncing around, each one has mass m, and the box has volume v, and we're keeping the box at a temperature t. What's the energy inside the box? Well, we're, we're, we're saying there's no potential energy. These things somehow thermalize, but they don't hit each other at all. And um, how many... How do you describe the microscopic state of the system? What do you need to describe the microscopic state? Well, you need all the positions and all the velocity components of all the molecules. Each particle has how many position coordinates? In three dimensions, three, right? Each particle has an x, y, and z coordinate. And each particle also has three components of velocity, right? So for every atom in the system, I've got to give you three positions, x, y, and z. I've got to give you three components of velocity, v, x, v, y, v, z. Okay, so that's six numbers per atom I've got to give you in order to describe what's going on in there. If there's n atoms, that means I've got to give you six n numbers to describe the state of the system. All right, now in terms of those, what is the energy? Well, the energy is one-half mv squared for each molecule. And, um, sorry, there shouldn't be a j there. That should just be v. It's one-half mv squared for each molecule, and that is one-half m times the sum of the squares of the three components for the first atom, plus the sum of the squares of the three components for the second atom, plus the sum of the squares of the three components for the third atom, Etc. There's going to be three n variables there added up in squared. We're assuming all the atoms have the same mass m, so I can factor that out, right? So the energy of the system is m over two times the sum of three n quantities, all of them squared, and those three n quantities are the velocity components of the atoms. What's the partition function then? Well, it's e to the minus beta times the energy summed over all the states of the system. But now they're not discrete states, they're continuous. This is classical mechanics. So I've got to integrate over all velocities, 3n of them. There's 3n integrals there. And then I've got to integrate over all the positions, and there's 3n integrals there as well. Well, the position integrals are easy. Right? The position integrals, integrand doesn't depend on position at all. So if I integrate, three of these coordinates, x, y, and z, I'm going to get the volume of x. And there's going to be n of those, so I'm going to get volume to the n there. Okay, so the, the position integrals give me volume to the nth power. That's the volume raised to the power of the number of atoms in the box. This is a strange function, but let's keep going. 
How about the velocity integrals? Well, there's three n of those same, because that exponential, e to the minus v1 squared, minus v2 squared, minus v3 squared, can be split up. The exponential of the sum is the product of the exponentials. So I'm just getting three n different exponentials, each one of which looks like this. And now you can go run into your table of integrals, and you can figure out that, that the in, this integral inside there is just the square root of 2 pi divided by the mass atom divided by beta the inverse temperature. And three, the square root of something raised to the 3n power can, can be expressed as 3n over 2 because square root is half power. And 1 over beta is just the temperature. So I'm going to put your numerator instead of beta in the denominator. And look what I've done. I calculated the partition functions. It wasn't all that difficult. And now, according to our theorem, the free energy is minus the temperature times the logarithm of this. But when I take the logarithm of this, this thing is made to take the logarithm of It's all powers here, right? When you take the logarithm of a power, the power just turns into something that multiplies. If I take the logarithm of b to the n, I get n log z. If I take the logarithm of this piece, I get 3n over 2 times the logarithm of what's inside. The logarithm of what's inside includes the logarithm of t plus the logarithm of a bunch of constants. So this is the, I'm going to differentiate this so I don't care what the constants are. This is the only part that matters. So now I have the free energy, just for microscopic considerations. And remember that the pressure is the negative of the derivative of the free energy with respect to volume. Take the derivative of that with respect to volume, and I get that minus the pressure is minus nt over b, or pressure times volume is proportional to temperature. And we just derived the equation of state of the ideal gas from assuming that it was a little molecule. Yep. Part of the ideal part of this statement that there is no potential energy? Yes. Is that the only? Is there anything else? Yeah, there's one other thing. That we're also assuming that the atoms have zero volume. That they don't exclude any of the volume available to the system. So the max will allow us to allow to be to the end. So those are the only two things that go into the word ideal? Those are pretty much the only two things that go into the word, uh, the word ideal. Now, there's a way to fix up this argument to include potentials between the atoms, but it's much harder to demonstrate. And it's called the Meyer. I'm sorry? Is this a uh, attractor? I mean, the potential. Yeah, you could, put in, you could put in both attractive and repulsive uh, between atoms. Usually, what happens between atoms is they attract one another for a while, but then if they get too close, they retire. And you can include that in there. and it, it, the, the study of how to include that in this calculation can be found in statistical physics books under the name of Meyer cluster exponentials and that kind of thing. So you can do it, uh, but it's, it's harder to do. This calculation is relatively simple. But it should be striking to you that we started with nothing but the notion of particles banging around with kinetic energy 1 half mv squared, and out came the equation of state of the ideal gas. That's an amazing connection between the microscopic and the macroscopic. It was a question. Can we have a control over microscopic level to specify specify direction of the atoms? They can now manipulate experimentally individual atoms. It's very hard to do, I think. But, but it can be done. They can keep individual atoms in little potential traps and manipulate them with, with lasers and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, all of this theory assumes that you don't know the detailed microscopic velocities of the particles. All you know is the probability that they'll all have this particular set of velocities. And everything, as you noticed, everything in this theory is in terms of probabilities. Right, so if this is assuming that you don't know. If you knew all of the, the microscopic positions and velocities of the particles, in principle, you could use the laws of mechanics to follow each one of them individually. Notice that this method did not require you to do that. Um, so it's, it's statistical in nature. Other questions?
one last thing about criminal statistics, and then I can just tell you a few words about what Salas has done and let him tell you the rest of it. Is there a way to express entropy in terms of this microscopic theory? Yeah, there is. Boltzmann and Gibbs have told us that the, that the probability of a microstate is this. And that means if I take the logarithm of the probability of a microstate, I get that. But now from thermodynamics, which we've now connected to, we know that the entropy is minus the ADT. And that's equal to this. Um, just from A being minus T times the logarithm of Z. And now that PK EK sum um, can be written in terms, thanks to this, that data EK that's sitting in there, can be written as log P minus log Z. And remember that the sum of the probabilities is 1. So this first term is minus log Z. It cancels that thing, and you're left with this. So the entropy of the system is just the negative of the sum of the probability times the logarithm of the probability. How many of you have seen this before in a different context? You get P log P summed over all the states of the system, and that gives you the entropy. Does it remind you of anything? Coding theory, maybe? Shannon and entropy. Good. Good. Very good. So, yeah, it's, it should strike you as kind of amazing that the notion of Shannon entropy, which is completely there for information theory, pops up in the entropy of a thermodynamic system. It's the same P log P and all of the properties of Shannon entropy that you learned in, in, in CIS courses, for example, are, are true for the entropy it's amazing that, that, you know, this idea that Clausius started in 1850 of finding this new thermodynamic variable combined with atomic theory leads to something like the Shannon entropy for atoms. That should strike you as, as kind of amazing. And again, this is, I, I think, one of the, the great successes of statistical physics. There's one thing that should bother you a little bit more, and that is... <laughs> Where on earth did e to the minus beta times the energy come from? You just assume that at the very beginning. I, I told you, Boltzmann and Gibbs proclaimed e to the minus beta times the energy. It led us to some nice results. Where did it come from? So one way that you can understand where it came from is to say that that's not the fundamental thing. The fundamental axiom that we should have taken is not e to the minus beta times the energy. The fundamental axiom we should have taken is that the entropy is this. By the way, this formula for the entropy, or something like it, is carved on Boltzmann's tombstone. You can go to Vienna, Austria, and on his grave is, is this formula. Right? So something like that formula, not exactly. I haven't made this pilgrimage yet, but one of these days, if I'm ever in Vienna, I want to see this. Um, you could have started with this. You could have said, this is our fundamental postulate. Entropy is equal to this. And once you know this, if I maximize the entropy at constant energy, I can derive the e to the minus beta t, e to the minus beta energy. In other words, the Boltzmann Gibbs probability distribution is derived by maximizing this entropy at constant energy. Okay, that's another way that you can axiomatize this theory. Right. But now you might say, well, where does P log P come from? What is so fundamental about P log P? Why should I believe that the entropy is P log P? Well, there's an important quality of entropy that you want to preserve, and P log P preserves it. And that is the following. Suppose that I have two systems. Suppose I have two containers of stuff, A and B, and they have nothing whatsoever to do with one another. Right? And maybe this is one container of gas and another container of gas. And the probabilities of this we'll call Pa sub i, 
and the probabilities of this system we'll call PB sub J. Now, the number of microstates might even be different in the two cases. That doesn't matter. Okay? This system can be in a bunch of states, and, and that's not an exponent, by the way. That's just a label. Okay, so. All right, now I've got these two states. Suppose I say that I don't want to consider them separately. I want to consider them together. That's one single thermodynamic state. Well, if this had NA microstates, and this had NB microstates, then the total has NA times NB microstates, combinatorically, because this one could be in any one of NA states, and this could be in any one of NB states, right? So there's a total of NA times NB states, and so the probability of the whole system, such that the first, the A part of it is in state I, and the B part is in state J, these are independent systems, so the joint probability is just the product of those two. Right? Now let's see what that gives us about the entropy. The, the joint entropy, the entropy of the whole system, is the sum over all the states of both systems together times that, P log P for the whole thing. But if PAB is the product of PA and PB, then the log of the product is the sum of the logs. And remembering that the sum of each one individually has got to be 1, right, if I sum PA over I, I get I, and if I sum PB over J, I get 1. Then the rest of this goes away, and I get this and this separately. And that means that the entropy of the whole system is just the sum of the products. The entropy of the whole is just the sum of the entropies of the two systems. And that means that the entropy is an extensive quantity. If I take a system with entropy SA and a system with entropy SB, and I stick them together, the total entropy is SA plus SB. Okay, that's kind of a good thing. What is Shannon entropy? Okay. I'm sorry? Shannon entropy. Oh, the Shannon entropy? This is an entropy for, in, for information theory, which... Let me go into that. Let me just finish this quickly, and then I'll describe what Shannon entropy is. Um, the idea that the entropy is extensive is important. And the only way that that worked, that this little argument worked, is because the log of the product is the sum of the logs. That's what makes the entropy extensive, and that's why the expression for entropy involves logarithms. So now you could take as your fundamental postulate, the entropy is extensive. The entropy is additive. If you have the, ent uh, the entropy of the whole is the sum of the entropy of the class. Take that as your postulate. From that, you can derive the uh, Boltzmann Gibbs form for the entropy, this thing. From that, you can maximize that at constant energy and get the Boltzmann uh, Gibbs probability and everything else follows from those. So now, shortcomings of this theory. It works brilliantly for computing thermodynamic properties of solids, liquids, and gases. We did it for the ideal gas, but um, it's used by Feynman, for example, to compute the specific heat of helium, of uh, liquid helium, is arguably one of the greatest achievements of 20th century physics. It's one of the best things that you could compute using a pencil and paper in the 20th century, basically. It's a fabulous paper, and it uses nothing more than what I've showed you so far. The trouble is, when it works, it works brilliantly, but when it fails, it fails miserably. And there are systems that we know this whole program doesn't work for. Any systems that have long-range interactions, this doesn't work well for. Gravity. Right? Holding together a cluster of stars. Terrible. This doesn't work at all. A plasma where you have electrons with long-range Coulomb interactions between them. This doesn't work well at all. People can't use boltzmann gibbs statistical physics to compute the statistical properties of these things. If they have long-range interactions, long-time memory, long-range correlations, power law tails, all of these things 
seem to cause Boltzmann Gibbs theory to fail, and nobody knows why. Mind you that for many, many things it works wonderfully, but there is a whole class of problems for which it doesn't work. What did Salas do? And I'm going to let him tell you most of what he did. But here's the idea. You all know the story of geometry in the 19th century, right? For everybody up through the 20th century was forced to learn Euclid's postulates of geometry. Everybody had to read Euclid's elements. Everybody had to learn how to do geometric proofs. People believed that if anything was absolutely fixed, it was geometry. Okay, and, and it was obvious that straight lines were straight. It was obvious parallel lines never intersected. All of these things were considered obvious. And then in the 19th century, it was shown that they weren't so obvious after all. That there were perfectly consistent geometries that you could get in which some of these things weren't true. There were perfectly consistent geometries you could get where there were no parallel lines. No line parallel to a given one. There were perfectly consistent geometries that you could have where there were an infinite number of lines parallel to a given one. There were perfectly consistent geometries that you could derive in which the sum of the angles of the triangle did not add up to 180 degrees. It was possible to have not just one geometry, but many, many, many different geometries. And in order to figure out what the other ones were, all you had to do was negate one postulate, and that was Euclid's parallel postulate. Right? If, if that wasn't true, then many other possible geometries opened up. The parallel postulate looks a little bit out of place in Euclid's elements. It, 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 it's, it's, it says that if I have one line and one point external to it, there's only one line through that point parallel to the given line. All the other postulates are much simpler than that. I'm assuming you all studied high school geometry and encountered this. By denying one postulate of geometry, people like Lobachevsky and Gauss and others opened up the possibility that there were many, many different geometries. Then came Einstein and Hilbert in the beginning of the 20th century, who showed that, you know what, some of those other geometries are actually useful in nature. Salas tries to do the same thing in statistical physics. What's the postulate he negates? It's the extensivity of the entropy. The postulate he negates is that the entropy of, of the sum is the sum of the entropies. The entropy of the, the, the whole system is the sum of the parts. If that's not true, there's nothing forcing there to be a logarithm in the expression for the entropy. If that's not true, you're going to get something different from the Boltzmann-Gibbs probability distribution. And if the Boltzmann-Gibbs probability distribution isn't true, you're going to get different results for everything that you can do. The way that he did it is so mathematically elegant that it's worth just considering it for one minute. Instead of the exponential function, he defines the Q exponential. We're going to call it E sub Q to the X. And it's defined in this way. Now, if I take the limit of this expression as Q goes to 1, and you dust off your calculus books to remember how to take limits, you'll find that in the limit as Q goes to 1, the Q exponential of X is just Q to the X. We're also going to define the Q logarithm in this way. Okay, and once again, you dust off your calculus books, you find that the limit as q goes to one of this quantity is just the ordinary logarithm. Moreover, these two quantities, like the real exponential and logarithm, are inverse functions of one another. The q exponential of the q logarithm gives you the same number back, and the q logarithm of the q exponential gives you the same number back. They're inverse functions. Now, how do you do these limits? Again, get out your calculus books. Remember how to do L'Hopital's rule. Because you can see this is an indeterminate form. As q goes to, to 1, this is u to the 0 minus 1, which is 1 minus 1, which goes to 0. And down, and down to the denominator, it's also going to 0. So this is a 0 over 0 kind of limit. And you can do that and find out that it comes to log u. I'm not going to do the calculus for you. You can go home and do that. 
The point is that the Q exponential and the Q logarithm are one parameter deformations of the real exponential and the real logarithm. The Tsala's entropy is then de uh, defined to be the sum of P log 1 over P, except it's the Q logarithm. Now, if that were the real logarithm, the log of 1 over P would be negative log P, and you'd be right back to the Boltzmann Gibbs theory. So when Q goes to 1, you're back to the Boltzmann Gibbs theory. Okay, so this is Salas's entropy. This is what he wants to use. He has one other postulate. He says when you compute the internal energy, instead of just weighting the internal energy by the, the microscopic energy by the probabilities, weight them by the probability to the Q power. And when you do that, you'd better normalize it by uh, dividing by the sum of the probabilities. He calls this the Q expectation value of the energy. Use that expectation value to get the internal energy and use the Thales entropy instead of the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy. The whole theory reduces to Boltzmann-Gibbs when Q is equal to 1. So Boltzmann-Gibbs is a subset of the Thales entropy. It's, a, it's one case. But what Thales claims is that sometimes this theory works better when Q isn't 1 to describe the physical system. By the way, from that entropy and holding this constant, you can figure out the microscopic <coughs> probabilities. They are Q exponentials instead of exponentials of minus beta times the internal energy. And the constant, the normalization constant, is 1 over the Q partition function, which is defined the same way with the Q exponentials. The amazing thing is that thermodynamic properties like this one, which we derived earlier, still work. They don't care. You can derive upwards all of thermodynamics, and it all still works. The only things that don't work are additivity and the entropy. The, entro the Q entropy of the whole is not just the sum of the parts. It's the sum of the parts plus 1 minus Q times the product of the and again, notice, when Q is 1, it works. It's additive, it's extensive. When Q is not 1, the entropies don't add. Depending on whether Q is bigger than 1 or less than 1, it can be super additive or so on. Um, what has he applied this to? He's applied it to fluid turbulence, which is not well described by statistical physics. He's applied it to gravity, globular clusters of stars. He's applied it to particle physics. He's even applied it to the motion of little hydra, uh, one-celled creatures running around in water. Uh, he's applied it to things that you wouldn't usually apply statistical physics to, the frequency of words in linguistics. Pure electron plasmas, low-dimensional dynamical systems of much too low dimension you might not think of applying statistical physics to it because it's so low dimensional. But there are problems. Uh, what he's done is to define a whole set of, of theories of statistical physics, not just one. Is there any a priori way to know what Q is? For many systems, we know Q equals 1 works. Boltzmann Gibbs theory is Q equals 1. If you give me a system, for which it doesn't work, is there any way that I can know what Q is before I go into this? So far, no. Can Q be related to other properties of the system? And why does this particular deformation of exponentials and logarithms work? Why this particular deformation of the entropy with Q? Why does this work and others don't? Nobody knows the answers to these questions. But the comparison with experiment is striking. It often works. So, again, just as there's many different kinds of geometries, what Salas claims is that there's many different kinds of thermal statistics. Some of these seem to be able to describe certain phenomena better than Boltzmann gives, and it could be nothing short of a revolution in statistical physics, but there's all kinds of questions that remain to be answered.
I hope that that was helpful in giving you some of the background, including the mathematical background of what he's doing, so that when he talks tomorrow, or I guess the next day, it's Friday, um, you know, I think you'll go into it really understanding what he's doing. He's trying to change all of statistical physics in such a way that it accommodates complex systems, systems with long tails, long-range correlations, long-range forces. That's what he's out to do. There's 150 years of really good results based on Boltzmann Gibbs, but we know it doesn't work for everything. And it's a big challenge to figure out what it can be used for next. I went on a long time. Um, I did a little bit more. Good. Uh, so thanks for your attention. I hope that was helpful in your understanding. Uh, Brian's like to He's a very, fa very famous guy. And, uh, <laughs> um, very well known throughout the world. But uh, there is some controversy associated with him and his theories. Not everybody believes this deformation of statistical physics that he's done. Very short question. Yeah. For certain models, which trees are zero? It seems to be less than one of the most common cases. Well, for example, um, and, and I can explain where this comes from, but it requires a longer explanation. The globular clusters of stars, and, and in deriving the radial density profile of stars in the globular cluster. Q equals four sevenths works for certain. It's four sevenths of three sevenths. For certain theoretical reasons, that likely even works. That's one of the few cases where you can start with the microscopic dynamics and figure out where the solid center Most of it is just empirical. Most of it is he takes experimental results and he tries to fit yeah. I, I have a feeling that over the next 48 hours and maybe more, we can um, continue this maybe off, offline, if you will, or, 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 or informally. I think, uh, I think it's so a good thing. Thanks. Uh, okay, thanks.